Life, what's up? Good to see you. I want to welcome those of you watching at Church Online at our downtown campus, the Amarillo campus. We are pumped that you're here with us right now. And as many of you know, Pastor Chris has been out. Our lead pastor, Chris Colonis, has been out for the past few months, but he is back today. And so I want you to help me welcome Pastor Chris back to Experience Life. Thank you guys so much. I have missed you tremendously. It's been a, a difficult summer, as you probably heard, just for my family and I. In uh, June, in this summer, the doctors found a cyst on the back of my throat, and so it was causing me some, quite a bit of pain and discomfort. And so in July, they decided to surgically remove like a lot of the stuff in the back of my throat. I could go through all the names, and you wouldn't even have any idea what some of them are, all right, unless you're a doctor. And so they remove all this stuff. And so that's not exactly the best surgery for a public speaker, as you can imagine. And so I come out of that not being able to speak at all. And they said that some of the things that they were going to do in the back of my throat could like change my voice. I'm like, I don't know if that'd be good. They're like, it'd just be a little more nasally. I'm like, I don't need any more nasally up in my voice. All right. So hopefully it's, a, it's about the same. But and the surgery in July and then in August was basically just a month of recovery and kind of trying to get my voice back. It's not fully there, but we're getting closer and uh, just glad to be back this weekend. Love this church, love you guys, and, and I just think that our crew though, Brandon, Clayton, the crew that's been uh, teaching through this summer have just done a phenomenal job. Don't you guys agree? It's just been amazing. I'm like, see what I can do now, guys, I'll just come back as the janitor. You just keep doing what you're doing. You guys are fantastic. You don't need me, but it, it's, it's a thrill for sure to be back, to be speaking uh, today. But as, and one, th one thing too about just the whole summer experience. I know a lot of you guys have asked questions about it and, hey, what's the Lord taught you through it? We're going to do a whole series on it. Our next series is going to be a whole series just on kind of some of the suffering that we went through this summer. So I know many of you are kind of in the same boat going through some difficult times. Maybe it'll be a, a series that you'll enjoy as we just talk about some of the things God taught us through that time. I want you guys to know this weekend at Experience Life is our five-year anniversary. Isn't that awesome? Five years. And God has absolutely blown us away at all that he's done over the course of these five years. I mean, it's just been absolutely incredible. But let me remind you of our vision. That's why we're here. That's how we started this church. It's what we're still all about. It's, it's just our vision. Our vision and experience life is our name. It's real easy to remember. People ever ask you, hey, what's the vision of that crazy church that meets in a skating rink or a gym or a downtown bus station? What, what's their vision? It's just their name. Experience life. We're trying to help people experience life all God has for them in this life. That's what we were doing on day one. That's what we're doing now five years into it, trying to help people experience all God has for them in this life. Because what I know is that most people want to experience all God has for them in this life, right? They don't want to miss out on anything God has for them. And we believe that there are a number of experiences that God doesn't want any of us to miss. And we just call them at Experience Life Next Steps. Like this is our discipleship process. These are, these are steps that I've taken in my life with God that set my heart on fire and were experiences I was so glad that I was able to have with God taking next steps with him. And so that's kind of how we got this process. And I'm telling you, we have had thousands of people walk through some of these next steps and it has just been amazing since the beginning. So I thought one cool way to celebrate just what God has done over the last five years is to take you through each of these next steps and just rejoice together, applaud, go crazy over some of the things that God has done. Can we do that together? Can we do that? Does that sound like fun? Let me show you over here on, the, on this screen. First step in experience life we encourage people to take is to commit their life to Christ because you will not experience all God has for you in this life until you commit your life to Christ. And since the beginning, church, watch this, since the beginning, we have seen 4,367 people indicate they were committing their lives to Christ. Incredible. I'm telling you, that number matters to God. That is, that is individuals that have said, hey, putting my faith in Jesus, now I'm headed to heaven where before I wasn't going to be heading any place that I wanted to go. So 4,367 is awesome. That's a God number. Next step is to get baptized. Since the beginning, we've seen 2,217 people go public and get baptized. Isn't that awesome? 
Well, these are people not ashamed of Jesus, wanting to go public and let the world know they're followers of Jesus. Next step is to start volunteering. Currently, right now at Experience Life, we have 657 people that are volunteering on a regular basis, making all of this happen. Awesome. Next step is to start tithing. And right now, currently at Experience Life, we have approximately 200 families that are tithing, which is awesome. Let's give God a hand for that. This is a tough, a tough next step. This is, we talk about returning 10% of your income to the Lord, and so we're continuing to talk about this, but we're excited about approximately the 200 that made that decision. Get involved in a prayer gathering. That's the next one. And right now at Experience Life, in three prayer gatherings, we have 502 people that are attending on a regular basis. Isn't that awesome? And a prayer. <laughs> it's been our goal since the beginning to continue to gather people together to pray. We think that's so important. Next step is to get involved in a life transformation group. Right now we have 850 e-lifers that are involved in an LTG. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Next step is to lead a life transformation group. Right now we have 152 leaders, 152 groups that are currently meeting at Experience Life. And that, in five years, 152 groups. That's a God thing for sure. And then the last step is to coach life transformation group leaders. You've led a group, now you're coaching groups. Got 27 coaches of all these 152 groups. Can we just thank God for all that he's done? And I just want you to hear, the, hear this straight from my mouth. We give Jesus the credit for all of this. This isn't about us, it isn't about experience life, it isn't about a staff, it's about Jesus. He's in the business of changing people's lives and we're getting to see it right before our very eyes. It's been an amazing five years. I know some of you guys have been here since the beginning, others of you just started coming recently, but man, we have just been thrilled to get to be a part of what God is doing in this West Texas region. It's just awesome. So as I was thinking about like what series we would do for our five-year anniversary celebration, I thought that it would be cool to do a series called Awakening where we just share stories from the Bible, but also like current e-life stories of people that have been awakened by God. How many guys are like me and you love to hear a powerful story? Anybody besides me love to hear a powerful story? All of our campuses, yeah. So in this series, we're just gonna tell you some stories, tell you some of the Bible. In our church, people have been awakened by God. And what's so cool about that is all of us have a tendency at times to fall asleep spiritually. And so when you hear these stories of people being awakened by God, it gives you hope that if you're asleep spiritually, God can wake you up as well. And I believe today at all of our campuses, God's going to wake some people up and this day is going to be one of the best days of their entire life. It's going to be awesome. So let's start in your Bible, Acts chapter 16. Let's start with an awakening story in God's Word. Acts 16, page 151 in the blue ones. All of our campuses, these are easy to understand translations of the New Testament. You can pick one up on your way out. They're free. It's on us. And we'll get to some of the verses here in a minute, but I'm just going to tell you the story. Instead of reading you the story, I'm just going to tell you the story. It's a fascinating story. And then we'll go to a few verses here on the screen in just a minute. But let me, let me tell you this story. Acts 16. There are two guys, missionaries. Their names were Paul and Silas. They were traveling around, sharing the gospel, planning churches, telling people about Jesus and all of a sudden they're looking for a place to go act 16 they're not sure where they're supposed to go so one night Paul has a vision the Bible says he has a vision it's a, this guy from Macedonia saying to him in the vision pleading with him hey Paul would you come and help us like we need help up in Macedonia like we need some churches up here we need the gospel to be preached up here Paul would you come and help us <clears throat> so after this vision Paul concludes hey this is this must be from God this this vision is from God so we should go to Macedonia so let me show you on a map where they end up going to. They go to a major city called Philippi in the region of Macedonia. Here's Macedonia here, Philippi here. Just in case you're looking at this going, okay, modern day, where is this? This is like Turkey, modern day, Greece, Italy's over here, Russia, all right, Israel back over this direction. So Philippi, they end up in Philippi in the region of Macedonia. So they're hanging out in Philippi, they're preaching the gospel. Well, one day, they run into this girl, young girl, and she was demon-possessed, the Bible says. And in fact, she was a psychic, like a fortune teller. And she earned her masters a lot of money because evidently, when these clients would come to her, these demons would give her insight into what was going on in their lives, and so she was making all this money. 
Well, once she meets Paul and Silas, this demon-possessed slave girl, she starts following them around. And she's trying to distract them as they're speaking and distract, you're trying to distract all the people that are listening to them. So the Bible says she's following them around. She's just shouting at them. She's shouting at Paul, shouting at Silas, shouting at the people that they're talking to, just, you know, annoying everybody. So it says a few days into it, Paul had just had enough. And he looked at this little demon-possessed slave girl. And in Jesus' name, he commanded the demon to come out of her. So all of a sudden, she was free. It was a great thing for her but not so much for her masters. They were not very happy. They were like, we just lost the demon. Okay, this is not good because now she's not gonna be a very good psychic. We're not gonna be able to make that much money. And so they were furious. Her, master, her masters were furious with Paul and Silas. So the Bible says they dragged them to the city authorities and said, these guys are throwing the city into an uproar and they're teaching all these customs that you know, we're not supposed to practice. And these guys are just doing stuff in our city that, that you, you, know, you need to punish them for. So the city officials order that Paul and Silas be stripped down like naked, all right? Just imagine being in their shoes. You feel like God's called you to this region. They arrest you. You're stripped down naked. And the Bible says they start to beat them severely with wooden rods. You're stripped down, and you're just all these guys just hitting you as hard as they can. The Bible says when they were severely beaten, like beaten to a pulp, they went to the jailer and said to the jailer, hey, Mr. Jailer, Put these guys in the jail and make sure, like, put them somewhere where they're not going to get out. Make sure they don't escape. So the jailer's like, hey, I got that down. So he puts them in the inner dungeon or, like, solitary confinement, and he chains not only their wrists together, but their ankles together as well. All right, so put yourself in Paul and Silas's shoes. You think God's calling you to go to Philippi, and you're only there a couple days, and now you made these, these masters of this demon-possessed slave girl mad, and now you've been beaten almost to death. Now you're in jail. You're chained together, solitary confinement. You're going, God, was that you in that vision? I'm not even sure if that was you, because I don't, how did all of this happen? Like, what is going on? You can imagine, right, what you might be thinking. But I want to show you something, a verse in this chapter that fascinates me. So here they are in prison chain, uh, legs, you know, ankles chained together, wrists chained together, solitary confinement. And here's what they're doing in the prison. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were, help me with this, they were what? They were praying and what? Singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. <laughs> Somebody explain that to me. I mean, you're just beaten almost to death. You're chained up in solitary confinement. And all you can think to do around midnight is, you know, sing Amazing Grace at the top of your lungs, you know, and you're singing and you're praying to God. I mean, is that what you would have done? I mean, I think about it from my perspective. I'm like, is that what I would have done? I'm thinking, no, he probably would have said. And Chris was freaking out and complaining to God, and the other prisoners were listening to him. Isn't that what you do? Like, God, these chains are hurting my ankles. Get them off me. You know, I mean, something like, God, you told me to come here. Now I'm getting beaten to death. What in the world is this all about? They're like, no, none of that. I'm just going to sing Amazing Grace. You know, I mean, they're just, singing, they're just singing and praying. I'm like, what kind of faith must you have to when you suffer, your first instinct or response is to pray and sing rather than freak out and complain? But to me, that's what on fire people do. People whose hearts that have been revived by God, that's what they do. Their, their inclination is to pray and sing hymns because they know God is ultimately in control. This is Paul and Silas. Pray and sing hymns. And then, I love this, the other prisoners were listening. Probably at 3.30 in the morning, you know, listening and then finally plugging their ears like, tell the guys to shut up. We're trying to go to bed. Why are they so excited? They've been beaten and they're in chains. Well, the Bible says... Around then, an earthquake hit, and the doors of the prison were all opened, and the shackles on their wrists and on their ankles were broken off, not just for them, but for all of the prisoners there. So the jailer finally wakes up, hears about all this, he sees what's going on, he's thinking the prisoners have escaped, and so the jailer draws his sword to kill himself. But Paul and Silas stop him and say, whoa, 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 Mr. Jailer, well, hang, hang on. Hey, hey, put that back up. Put that up. You don't need to kill yourself, man. We're all still here. So the Bible says that the jailer called for the lights. Lights come on, and it says that the jailer came trembling to the feet of Paul and Silas on his knees. And he had a question he wanted to ask him. It was a profound question. And here's what it was. His question for Paul and Silas was this. 
he brought them out and he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be what? Like he launches out with a God question right from the get-go. Like he's thinking, okay, this Paul and Silas guys, that was their God probably that sent the earthquake because they're free now. Um, they must be from God. So I'm going to ask them the God question. Like the question that only God can ultimately answer. Now in this day and age, what's so confusing is most people think that they can answer this question without hearing from God. It's really funny. I mean, you just talk to people, you're like, hey, well, what do you think it takes to get saved? Somebody's like, well, I just, I think that, you know, you just... You know, you got to be a good person, you'll be saved. Hey, I just think if you're nice to people, I think if you don't commit that sin, you'll be saved. Hey, I think if you'll do these things, go to church, read your Bible, you'll be saved. They come up with all these things. They're not God, yet they come up with some these authoritative responses to what must you do to be saved when how would they know? Because there's only one way to get saved, and that's God's way. There's only one way to heaven. That's God's way to heaven. So the jailer understood this. In order to know the answer to this question, you don't poll an audience. You try to find an authoritative source like a Bible that you know comes from God or some men that seem to have come from God that would be able to give you a God answer to a God question. What must I do to be saved? A lot of people asking questions like that these days. Different forms. What do I have to do to go to heaven? <clears throat> How can I be made right with God? I mean, that people are interested in questions such as these. So he asks them, and then they respond very simply. Next verse. <clears throat> they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. You can imagine what the jailer was thinking. He was thinking, that's it? Like, you're saying, if I want to be saved, like I'm a sinner, if I get what I deserve one day, it's not heaven, I should go straight to hell. But you're saying, if I, if I, if I want to be saved, all I've got to do, or just really a decision I've got to make, is just to believe in Jesus, and I'll be saved? I mean, is that it? Like, don't I have to, like, do a certain number of things for God? Don't I have to quit doing some of these things, and start doing some of these things, and go do a few of these things? And, you know, don't, don't I have to, do, like, like and shouldn't there be, like, a, this year, like, period of time where I have to prove that I'm worthy of this first? I mean, that's what everybody thinks, you know? It can't be that simple. It can't, it can't be that. Surely you've got to do something. And Paul and Silas would have been like, nope. If you want to be saved, you want to go to heaven, whatever, just believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved along with everyone in your household. Do you know how good that news would have been to the jailer and his family or to anybody else? Hey, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what your past looks like, believe in Jesus, he'll wipe it out. Believe in Jesus, he'll give you a fresh start. You don't have to do anything for him. Just make the decision to put your trust in him. That's good news. Now, some people read this and they don't really totally get it because we use this word believe in our language in a different way than I think it was intended here based on what you see in the original language. New Testament was written in what? Some of you know Greek. New Testament was written in Greek. So this verse was originally in Greek. It was translated into English. So a good question would be, what's the word, the Greek word, behind this word believe so that we know what he means by believe? Because I think initially we hear it and we just think to ourselves, okay, what he's saying to the jailer is just believe that Jesus existed and you'll be saved. That's not what that means. Well, just believe the facts about Jesus. This is what Paul and Silas are telling them. Maybe you're thinking as you read this. Just believe the facts about Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. Believe those facts and you'll be saved. That's what he's saying, right? That's not the sense of the word believe. The word believe in Greek, it's translated believe, is the word pistuo. Make sure you say that fast and say the whole word, all right? Don't cut that off. Pistuo. Here's what it means if you just look in a Greek dictionary. Take a look at this. Here's what this word believe means. It's pissed you on a Greek dictionary. Watch this. To entrust oneself to an entity with complete confidence, with implication of total commitment to the one who is trusted. Question, is that how we usually use the word believe? No. We just think, I believe the Cowboys are going to win. I believe the Rangers. You're not saying, it's not complete confidence, not total commitment to somebody, your life into somebody else's hands. The idea here is not just believing facts about Jesus. The idea here is complete confidence in Jesus to save you, total commitment to Jesus to save you. That's why we often, when we explain this process of 
getting saved, we use the phrase committing your life to Christ. So based on the definition of the word here, pistuo, you might could translate that, not just believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, but commit your life to the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Believe is good if you understand what believe means, but we, we don't often understand what it means in this context. So maybe a better way to understand this verse is commit your life to the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So he's telling, these guys are telling the jailer, hey, you want to be saved? You want to go to heaven one day, all of that? Commit your life to Christ. Turn from your sin, turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus to save you, not you to save you. We're not asking you to believe facts about them. I mean, you start off with the facts, you believe those, but it's not just facts. It's a commitment of yourself to Christ. It's complete confidence in Jesus, entrusting yourself to Jesus, total commitment to Jesus. And here's what I have come to realize. This doesn't describe a lot of people that would claim to be Christians because they believe facts about Jesus. Yet this, this idea of committing your life to Christ, is what they're telling the jailer it takes to be saved. So I think there's a lot of people even here today at our church that would say, hey, I believe Jesus existed and because of that I thought I was saved. Well, I believed all these facts about Jesus because of that I thought I was saved. And Paul and Silas are telling the jailer, the way you get saved is this, is committing your life to Jesus, totally trusting in Jesus to save you, complete confidence in Jesus. A lot of people haven't made that decision. Oh, they've believed facts about Jesus all of their life but they've never committed their life to Jesus, so much so that as a result, their lives were completely changed. And that's what happens when you commit your life to Jesus. Look at the next verse. This is good. So it says, and they share the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. So they hear this word, believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. And what we learn, you'll see it a few verses later, is that the whole family is awakened. Like, they were asleep spiritually and God woke them up. I mean, can you imagine how they felt? They went from not knowing how to be saved, that's why he was asking the question, to now I am saved, I'm right with God, I'm a child of God, I'm accepted in his side, I'm no longer under condemnation, he loves me, I'm his kid. Can you imagine what that does to you when you understand those truths? It changes your life. So don't you think when they were awakened, him and his whole family, that his friends would have taken notice? Oh, yeah, they would have been asking him, hey, what's so different about you? What changed in your life? Why are you so different? Because when somebody's awakened, they're just totally different. People notice. Look at the next verse. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were, what are these two words? Immediately baptized. So why'd they get baptized? Like that was quick. They just, got, they just got baptized. Because the Bible teaches that when you're awakened, when God saves you, first step of obedience is you go public and you let the world know you're a follower of Christ. Now here's, here's the thing, and I get this. I get this if this is you. So many people these days don't understand what baptism is. Because you talk to this group of people and they say baptism is one thing. You talk to this group, this denomination, here's another thing. And this group and it's mystical and it's, does it do this and what exactly is baptism? Here's simply put what I think baptism is based on what the Bible says. It's, it's real easy. This is what baptism is. Simple. A public declaration of a new association. It's just somebody who's been awakened saying, I'm publicly declaring to the world I'm associated with Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. That's what baptism is. And the Bible says, you see it in the New Testament, that when somebody got saved, when somebody believed in Jesus and their lives were changed, they were awakened, they got, they got baptized. That's just what you do. That's just what everybody did. But then go back to this verse again here a second. Look at this word right before baptize. This is, this is what's interesting about the book of Acts, if you haven't noticed this before, and really throughout the New Testament. Is he and his household, and everyone, then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Here's what's different between them and us. A lot of times people get saved, commit their life to Christ. This day and age, they get baptized two years later or 10 years later, or if they want to, or, you know, some other time or whatever. New Testament, it's like, find me some water, somebody. Like, where's the lake? We need a lake up in this place. Can we need some water? Because I just gave my life to Christ. I just got awakened by God. I need to get baptized. So they wouldn't wait they didn't wait two years. They didn't wait till they became a good Christian. That's what some people think. Oh, you got to wait till you're a good Christian. Then you get baptized. No, they committed their life to Christ. And then they immediately, you see this all throughout the Bible. They immediately would get baptized. Probably because they were so excited to go public. Let the world know, 
I've been awakened by God. I was asleep, but he woke me up. Last year at Experience Life, some of you are here, but we did something nuts. Of course, if you've been coming here very long, you're like, that would be every weekend. All right, so I know what you're thinking. But we did something pretty nuts last year. Some of you haven't heard about this, I'll just tell you. But we were doing a baptism series, and we'd had these summer baptism celebrations before where we would sign up all these people and baptize a lot of people in a day. And it was great. (laughs) But as we were thinking about last year's summer baptism celebration, we just thought, why don't we do a baptism celebration Book of Acts style. I remember some of the staff looking at me and looking at each other like, what what do you mean by that? Like Book of Acts style. We were like, what if we teach on baptism and give people the opportunity to be immediately baptized? Like, no, you don't have to sign anybody up. Just have them come. And if God's placing it on their heart, that that's their next step. Just have them get up from their chair, go change clothes, have clothes in the back, get up from the chair, change clothes, and just get dunked right then and there. We all kind of looked at each other like, that would be nuts, all right? That would be the craziest thing any of us have ever heard of, but that would be pretty cool because that's kind of how it was in the book of Acts. So last year we tried it. We had no idea if anybody would stand up and go get immediately baptized, but we talked about baptism over a two-week period. We said, hey, if God's leading you to get baptized, why don't you stand up right where you're at, head to the back. We have clothes for you to change into, we'll, and then you can come back out here and we'll baptize you. Experienced life in a two-weekend period last year, over 600 people immediately got baptized, wanting the world to know they were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two-week period, over 600 spontaneously got up right from where they were sitting, went to the back, changed, and got baptized. Is that not awesome in a two-week period? That blew us away. Because we were thinking, oh, maybe one will do it, maybe two, who knows. But then over 600, we just couldn't believe it. It was so awesome. And I remember we were talking amongst ourselves thinking, that was one of the greatest experiences we've ever had at Experience Life. Everybody was agreeing. So I remember us thinking to ourselves, we should do that again. That would be awesome if we did that again. So I got good news, Experience Life. We're doing it again today. Today's the day. (laughs) We're doing it again. And some of y'all are like, Dad, gummit, I didn't know I was coming on this day. See, I didn't even know that. I just thought I was going to come in and hear some guy talk, be a little bit funny and leave. No, actually, actually, God may want to do more in your life today than just that. Here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a video in just a second. But then we're going to give people the opportunity to respond. There's some people that are listening to me talk, and you recognize it's a next step for you. You haven't taken it. I'm going to pray today. You, ha- you have boldness to immediately, book of Acts style, go public and get baptized. I'm going to tell you more about it in just a minute, but I just wanted to give you a little hint as to what we were doing so you could start praying about it and getting your heart ready. Because some of you that were clapping just a second ago, a second ago going, yeah, it's going to be awesome, you need to get baptized, all right? And so we're going to give you that opportunity in just a minute, but... I want you to hear a story of a family that goes to our church at our Amarillo campus, the Babcock family, how they were recently awakened by God. Powerful story, and I thought you'd enjoy it. So take a look. I grew up as a, as a Catholic. Everything was, was the Catholic religion. You, you went to church every Sunday. You did catechism. You, um, I mean, I went through all the steps. Uh, His mom pushed him as well to go to church uh, growing up and through high school, I still stayed. I think he kind of tore off away from it. I remember one of the the churches that we went to, the message that they talked about, when I left, I actually felt bad. I felt bad about myself. I felt bad like they were really just talking down on, on all of us. We ended up moving in together and uh, pregnant with our first child. And at that point in time, I decided I was done. Um, That was 12 years ago. We went to Vegas, got married, and we never went to church again. I felt like I just had a real empty life, an empty spot in my heart. Um, I felt alone, Um, you know, a lot of the time. We spent um, a lot of time just being angry about things and, you know, always asking those questions like, like we talked about today is why. Why is this not happening for me? Um, And it was a more selfish life. Marriage was in a rough spot. Our our home life, we were constantly fighting, constantly arguing, um, created, I ended up very depressed and emotional. 
Um, literally would go to work and come home and just, I, I mean, fall asleep as, as fast as I could because I didn't want to be in that, in that state of mind. We had a pretty rough beginning of the year. We just had no idea where life was going, where our marriage was going. At that point in time, our lives were, we didn't know which way our, our marriage was going to go. We started marriage counseling. Um, she recommended getting into a church. Two days later, your flyer showed up. When we got when we got the flyer in the mail, you know, for eLife, something wouldn't let us throw it away. Any other mail that comes in like that would have been not even looked at twice. But something, just, like I said, just would not let us throw this away. It was just like, yeah, let's give it a try. So we came to church for the first time. We sat through the message, and the message um, touched us both. Uh, we both cried. It, it meant a lot to us, and, and we could definitely relate. We went to the next step, and Parker was there. So we decided to commit our lives, and Parker asked us if he could pray over us. We just told him we had circumstances that we were running into. He sat and prayed over us and... Read us like a book. God told him exactly what to say. Exactly what to say. He knew nothing about our situation and the words were the correct words. And at that point in time, we knew that this is where we needed to be. And this is what we needed to be doing. And the following week, we were baptized. And ever since then, life's been amazing. And I left here feeling good. I felt great about myself. Since I've committed my life to Christ, I feel like I have a best friend that will never turn their back on me and that I can always talk to about anything. I can always count on him. I felt like every aspect of my life was slipping away and he took our family and just brought us all right back together and, and gave us a bond that's stronger than we've ever had. And, you know, my family is my life. And he made sure that I got to keep that. There's a possibility we may not have made it to our 11 year anniversary yesterday. And I think we're happier now than we've ever been. Isn't that powerful? Simple stories of awakening, people being asleep spiritually, and God waking them up. Question for you today at all of our campuses is have you been awakened? Do you have an awakening story like the jailer? He has one. The Babcock family, they have one. Do you have a story of being awakened by God? And when you were awakened, your life was changed because if not, I got good news for you. Your story can begin today. It's just about committing your life to Christ, just like we talked about. The answer to the question you've been asking all your life, how do you get saved, get to heaven? They just answered it. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. That's it. Jesus plus nothing. Faith in Jesus is all he requires. Turning from your sin, putting your trust in him, we call it committing your life to Christ. You make that decision today, your life will totally be changed. You'll know that you're saved, forgiven, going to heaven, right with God. It's an unbelievable experience. And it's not a magic formula. It's just you and your heart saying, Jesus, best I know how, I commit my life to you. Some of you need to be awakened today. You know who you are, and God's calling you right now. The Bible makes it clear that once we're awakened by God, we should be spiritually awakened. We get saved, commit our lives to Christ. We should be immediately baptized. So there's two groups of people, and we're not going to put pressure on people today. If you're first time guest at any of our campuses, we don't do pressure, but we do do challenges, all right? So two groups of people today that we would challenge to be baptized. Number one, if you're committing your life to Christ today at any of our campuses, you should immediately get baptized today. Eli, how cool would it be to see people who commit their lives to Christ today get baptized today? Would that be cool? Experience life to see that. Oh, yeah. That's you. Today's your day. In a second, you have a chance to walk to the back, get changed. We've got everything you need, and, and you can get baptized. Second group of people, and this is going to be a lot of people, are those that have already committed their lives to Christ. You understand what it takes to be saved. You were saved 10 years ago or 20 years ago, five year, years ago, however long. But you haven't been baptized since making that decision. 
Maybe you were baptized before as a baby or you're in, you know, maybe as an elementary age kid and your parents told you, if you go up and get baptized, I'll buy you Krispy Kreme afterwards. And you're like, yes, mom, thank you. I will do. You got baptized and it was kind of more your parents' deal than it was your deal. If you have not been baptized since committing your life to Christ, we challenge you that today is your day. Immediately, as you see in the book of Acts, go for it. Go public and get baptized saying, hey, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. A couple statistics for you. Just this year at Experience Life, we've seen 1,177 people indicate they were committing their lives to Christ, which is awesome. But we've seen this year, and we're excited about this, only 353 people go public and get baptized. So just among this group of people, that, and many of you that have checked on a card, I'm committing my life to Christ, there's still 824 of you that need to take that next step and go public and let the world know you're a follower of Jesus by getting baptized. So 824, just among e-life commitments, people that have committed here, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of you that have committed your life to Christ a long time ago and you've just never been baptized since then. And today's your day as well. So two groups, if you're getting saved today, you should get baptized today. If you've been saved for who cares how long and you hadn't been baptized since then, Bible would make it clear, you should be baptized as a profession of your faith, even if somebody else baptized you as a profession of their faith. Now, let me answer a couple of your objections because you're looking at me going, you are insane. You've been gone for three months. Something happened to you. This is insane. What is this all about? A couple of objections. Number one, you might say, here's the thing, pastor, for me, like baptism, that's what crazy on fire people do. I'm not one of those fanatical crazy people or whatever. That's what crazy on fire people do. I'd say, no, that's what Christians do. That's what Christians do. If you're a Christian, call yourself a follower of Jesus because you've committed your life to Christ and you're unwilling to be baptized after having made that decision, you need to ask yourself the question, why am I so ashamed of Jesus? He went ashamed of me. Why am I so ashamed of him? Another objection. Somebody might say, well, my parents, they might get upset because they already did it for me. Like, I don't remember it. I, you know, I think I was there, but I was like two months old or maybe I was six years old. But they, they just told me they like bribed me and I did it and I'm thankful and all that. But they, they've told me before, like, I kind of did that. And what I'm saying to you from the Bible is, again, nothing wrong with it. It's a great thing. But you getting baptized today as a symbol of your faith is really a fulfillment of what they were doing for you as a symbol of their faith. That was a symbol of their faith, not yours, because you hadn't committed your life to Christ. So we have people here all the time that go public and get baptized that have been baptized at some other time in their life, but they recognize it wasn't a public declaration of their faith. It was a public declaration of somebody else's faith. So of course your parents shouldn't be upset that you're taking a next step spiritually with God. I mean, that's awesome. You're not rejecting what they did for you. You're fulfilling it. You're saying, it's my turn now. My faith is my own now, and I'm wanting the world to know I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Others of you might say, objection, here's my objection. Um, I, I was planning to do that later. Like I was thinking about it and I thought about it and I was like, I'm gonna do that later. And I it just got news for you. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Come on. You're gonna walk right out of your campus today and you're gonna talk yourself out of God's will for your life. That's what you're gonna do. That's what we often do when we say, oh, I'm gonna do that later. I think that's one of the reasons they got baptized immediately so they didn't go home and talk themselves out of something God was calling them to do. Some of you say, well, what about my family? I don't have my family here with me today. I got good news. We're going to tape this thing. You're going to be able to sit down in the comfort of your living room, watch your bad self on video, all right, and say to your grandma, that's me right there in that tank. That is me. I mean, we're gonna, we got videographers taping this at all of our campuses. And on top of that, we've got people taking pictures. We've got photographers at every baptism tank taking your pictures as you go down and, and come up. And then at all of our campuses, the week after this, we're going to have pictures for you, like to give you, that you can give to grandma and she can put it on her refrigerator. And everybody that comes to her, Al, she's like, that's my granddaughter right there. You know, I mean, we got that down. So we've thought about your family and we want them to be a part of this. And that's why we're doing those things for you as well. But don't want that to be a reason that you don't respond immediately today if, that would, that, if that's what God's calling you to do. Last objection, and this is the best one. It's this. You're looking at yourself thinking, I don't want to get this wet. I don't want to walk out of here soaking wet. Like I, I would not enjoy that. I want you to know. You may not have come prepared to get baptized today at all of our campuses, but we came prepared for you to get baptized today. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Show you a few things here that we have on hand at all of our Experience Life campuses, all right? Here's what we got. First of all, we've got a shirt. 
We got dressing rooms. You can change it. We got a shirt you can keep. It says Dunked at E-Life. This is a hip looking shirt. If you're struggling in the hip department, this will help you. All right. And you can wear this. And this is awesome. So we're going to give you this. You can keep it. We've got a shirt. We've got athletic shorts. All sizes. Guys and girls can wear these. And they're long. We're not doing Daisy Dukes this weekend at Experience Life or anything like that. We've got long shorts for you to wear. Covers all the way down and all that. we got undergarments both for the men and for the women. And good news, they are new, not used. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, did you recycle these from last year? Because if you did, I'm not getting baptized. I guarantee you that. They're new, and you can keep them and write E-Life on them or whatever you want to do. We got, uh, we got hair ties. We're going to put your hair back together for you. Curling irons, uh, blow dryers, uh, brushes, you know, do, do the brushes and all that. We've got exfoliating, cleansing towelettes. I have no idea what that is, but I'm sure that most of the ladies know what that is. We got that. We've got uh, lotion if you want some lotion. We got... Hand sanitizer, I have no idea why, but if your hands get dirty in the process, you got that. We got spray on deodorant, not the roll on kind. That would be sick, all right, so we got that. <laughs> Mega hole sculpting gel, some of you need product, I'm right there with you, I got that. We got some product for you in the bag, we'll put that hair right back where we found it, I guarantee you. <laughs> Hairspray, got that, we got mousse, man. I don't know why we have these, but it's pretty cool. We've got um, Q-tips in the back. I mean, in case you want to clean out your ears in the process or something, we, got, we just want to make sure we had everything. We've got uh, washcloths. We've got uh, plastic baggies for you to put your valuables in. We're going to wash those uh, for you. Um, and then I've, I've hidden this back here just, just because it needs to be hidden in church. In case you think we've forgotten something, ladies, we've even got on hand feminine hygiene products on hand so that there would be no excuses this weekend for anybody wanting to get baptized and knowing that God has called them to do that. Is this pretty cool? We got some good stuff going on. So I've asked Parker to be our model. Parker's our youth pastor and he's one of our uh, leaders at our Southwest campus. So Parker, would you come up and model some of these awesome looking clothes for us so that they all know what they're going to look like? Here's Parker and here's what it looks like. The baptism attire, <laughs> minus the glasses. Those are cool. Thanks, Parker. But that's, that's what it's, it's the clothes we got for you. They're in bags, all sizes. We just don't want there to be a reason that if you need to respond today that you aren't able to respond and do what God has called you to do. Here's what I want to do. I want to show you a video from last year so you can kind of see how this works. Again, no pressure, but some of you, God's speaking to you now. You know that this is something you need to do. Last night already, we had tons of people respond. They didn't even know they were going to respond. They responded and got dunked. It was amazing. Let me show you this video so you see what's going to happen. Now, I'm going to give you the opportunity to get up right from where you're at, go get changed in one of our dressing rooms, and come into this service. And during this service, we're going to baptize a bunch of people. So take a look at this video. So here's the deal. Jesus called many of you guys today to go public and acknowledge him publicly out there in that swimming pool by getting baptized. Experience life, now is your time. Tony's heading to the back. We got ushers in the back gonna show you where to go. If you need to get baptized today, you go. If he's calling you to get baptized, don't resist him today, not anymore. It's very special. It's a new yeah. step in our relationship yeah. and I'm excited yeah. for the future. I was baptized as a baby and I've just had a feeling that I've needed to do this for a while. I committed my life to Christ in 1972 and it took me until 2011 to my, finally make that profession. So. It was so exciting. We have given our life to Christ recently and uh, yeah, we wanted to not be ashamed of the gospel any longer. So exactly. We both got baptized. I feel like a new person. Praise God. Amen. That awesome. And I tell you, each of those 640 something people that were baptized last year would tell you is one of the greatest days of their lives. Some of you, God's calling you. And you saw us baptizing in the swimming pool last year. We're not doing that this year at our Southwest campus. We have tanks at all of our campuses, the front of the worship centers where we're going to baptize folks. I want you to know, though, we're going to limit this to middle school and up unless your child has completed our kid faith class because we want children to really understand 
about baptism before we have them get baptized. So middle school and up can spontaneously respond unless your child has completed our kid faith class. But I'm going to pray that God would give you boldness because right now some of you are thinking, I need to do it. I know that. But I don't know if I can get out of my chair. I don't know if I can do that. I'm going to pray for boldness. And we're going to give you the opportunity to respond. We're going to praise God as we see potentially hundreds of people say, this is my next step. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. He wasn't ashamed of me. I'm going public. I want the world to know I'm his follower based on my faith. Not my friend's faith, parents' faith. I appreciate all that based on my faith. Let me pray. God, thanks for my friends here today. There's some people here. They heard me talking about committing your life to Christ. And they know, hey, I believed facts about Jesus all my life. But I've never committed my life to him. Who am I kidding? My life hadn't been changed. I don't know him. I haven't been awakened by God. If that's you, would you just pray in your heart, Jesus, I commit my life to you today. Today, Jesus, I go on record to say, I trust you to save me, not me to save me. I turn from my sin. I commit my life to you, Jesus. And God, I pray for boldness for those that are praying that prayer right now to go public and get baptized today on the spot. It'll be one of the best days of their lives. God, for those that have been saved for a long time, maybe, but that they know they've never been biblically baptized, baptized after they committed their lives to Christ. I pray that you would give them boldness right now as well to respond, to get up out of their chair and be willing to go to the back, get changed, and come in and get baptized. God, give them boldness. I know you're, you're speaking to them and they think, I need to do this. I just can I, can I do it in front of all these people? God's calling you. Today is your day. He's going to be with you and he's going to do something awesome in your life through it. God, give people boldness now. Do something unbelievable right before our eyes blow us away we're looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in jesus name amen thanks for checking out one of our messages today if you made a decision to commit your life to christ i'd love to know about it you can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com also if you're interested in taking a next step check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on next steps let us know if we can ever serve you in any way and we look forward to seeing you soon